Um, okay, so before I really get into the science, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the terminology I'm gonna be using, um, because as you might imagine, talking about this topic can be very complicated. The science is complicated, but it has very real effects on present day descendants of the, the ancient people I'm gonna be talking about. So I wanted to find a few terms. and. We geneticists tend to give terms to populations in the past, but you shouldn't take that as, of course, this is what they referred to themselves as or thought of themselves as. Um, it's just for convenience. And it's also not meant to imply that these populations were pure in any genetic sense. No population is pure, has been or ever, ever has been. So it gets very complicated. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about Native Americans and indigenous peoples of the Americas. I'm using those terms pretty interchangeably for clarity and convenience sake, but they're not necessarily universally agreed on terms. So it's far better to, if possible, speak of present day peoples in terms of their nation or their tribe. Um, for example, I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Ka or the Kanza um, and the Osage peoples, right? Um, and I would identify them as such if I were talking about them that way. Um, when I'm talking about Native Americans or indigenous peoples of the Americas, I'm referring collectively to any present day member who's affiliated with a tribe or an indigenous community. That's not a genetic affiliation. Native Americans today are genetically very diverse. They share ancestries with populations all over the world. Um, but for those populations that predate European contact, um, I'm going to use the term first peoples as a shorthand for first peoples of the Americas. And I'll also use that term to refer to segments of their genomes that date back to those populations. So I hope that's sort of clear. <laughs> um, so I'm going to divide this talk into sections. In the first one, I'm going to give you an introduction to anthropological genetics and how we use genetic approaches to understand the past. And then I'll kind of take you more or less chronologically through the origins of Native Americans, the genetic origins of Native Americans, beginning with what we know of those populations who contributed their ancestry to um, in, in the upper Paleolithic. So in this talk, I'm talking about a period starting at about 36,000 years before present. And all dates I'm giving here are calibrated. Um, until about 25,000 years ago. And then I'll talk about what was going on genetically during the period that brackets the last glacial maximum. So I'm gonna be talking about a period between about 25,000 years ago to about 17,500 years ago, years before present, before 1950, of course. And then finally, I'll be talking about the dispersals into the Americas between about 17,000 um, to or 14,000 years ago. And then finally, kind of a wrap up, a summary, a discussion of some future areas of research and things like that. Okay, so there's two kinds of people who work in this field. There are those who are straight biologists and then there are those who are anthropological geneticists. And I'm in that latter category. Um, and most people don't know what that means. So I usually try to start with an introduction to our approaches in this field. Um, so anthropological genetics is a synthetic field where we take, we apply the methods and theories of genetics, population genetics to evolutionary and cultural questions of anthropology. And anthropological geneticists work on all aspects of human and sometimes non-human genetics. But in general, we tend to focus on two main questions. How do humans differ biologically and how have aspects of human histories shaped these biological differences. So genetic variation, um, both in ancient and modern um, genetic variation can be used to, un to understand demographic history and migrations and uh, ancestral descendant relationships, relationships between contemporaneous communities and disease and social structures and kinship practices, all kinds of different, um, uh, different questions. Over the last, I don't know, 25 years or so, it's become increasingly common for genetic research to investigate human population history, um, human origins, origins of different populations around the world, 
and the biological relationships between diverse human groups. And this body of research has yielded a really important, it really a, a set of really important uh, scientific insights about our past. Um, and population genetic studies, especially ancient DNA, tend to get a lot of media attention, a lot of media um, press. And this is great, we love that. Um, but it's also critical that this research needs to be rooted in archeological knowledge. And that hasn't always been the case when population genetics moves into anthropological genetics. So we kind of take slightly different approaches sometimes. And it's, I think, best when we collaborate the most, so. Okay, um, so I'm gonna kind of just give you a very brief overview of the different genetic systems and genetic markers that we use to study the past. I don't know, probably this is gonna be a bit under your knowledge. I mean, I think probably everybody already knows this, but just in case you don't, <laughs> I'll go through it. Um, so we study human diversity, human genetic diversity by looking at different sets of markers. And so the first marker that we used especially more common in the past was the mitochondrial genome, which is DNA present in the mitochondria of your cells. See the mitochondria? Here's a, a little image of it. Um, and it's a separate genome from the chromosomes that are found in your nucleus. Your mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited um, and it doesn't swap genes in and out with your chromosomes. So we say it's non-recombining. Um, and it's present in hundreds to thousands of copies per cell. And it also has a relatively high mutation rate. And that makes it extremely attractive for geneticists um, who can use it in population genetic studies, especially to look at evolution within the recent past. Um, by recent, I mean human, anatomically modern Homo sapiens past, but also um, older than that, a little bit older than that too. Um, this also makes it really attractive to ancient DNA research because there are so many more copies of mitochondrial DNA present in each cell than your, your uh, chromosomes, which of course you only have two copies of per cell, one from mom and one from dad. Um, and so it's much more likely to be preserved than chromosomal DNA. So many, many ancient and modern DNA studies are based on mitochondrial DNA. But the limitation of that is it only gives you a history of women, um, very specifically a very small, your very, just your direct maternal uh, lineage, your mother and her mother and her mother and her mother. That excludes a lot of your ancestors when you're just looking at mitochondrial DNA. So it's a limited glimpse of history. Um, another approach is to look at the Y chromosome. DNA. And that will, of course, give you paternal population history. Um, but it has some limitations. It's only giving you a direct male lineage. A lot of us don't have Y chromosomes. So if you don't know if a particular skeleton is male or female, you may not, you know, it's kind of a gamble to see if they have a Y chromosome. Um, and it's much less likely to be preserved than mitochondrial DNA. A third approach tracks autosomal, what we call autosomal markers or genetic markers across all of your chromosomes, your entire genome. And you can do that either by completely sequencing the genome or by choosing predetermined markers um, from thousands of places across the genome, which is actually a much cheaper, more cost-effective and easier way to get at it. Um, autosomal markers are much less likely to be preserved in ancient remains than mitochondrial genomes, but they give you all of your ancestors, at least up to a certain number of generations. So you get a lot, like, or many, many, many orders of magnitude more refined glimpses of population history using the whole genomes than you do with um, mitochondrial or Y chromosomes. So there are some other um, considerations when you're choosing to work with an ancient or contemporary sample. Um, so if you want to understand a population event of interest, like a bottleneck or a gene flow event, I, you know, I could sample the genetic diversity of, of present day populations, right? So there's a population event in the past. I can get at that by looking at its consequences in, in present day populations. Um, 
this is relatively easy to do um, and it doesn't have a lot of contamination issues or technical difficulties that ancient DNA works, uh, ancient DNA has, but it carries with it a specific set of ethical issues that necessitates careful consideration. And often you need as a researcher, a lot of time and, um, and, and work to build a working relationship with a community in order to build that trust that they'll be willing to give you their DNA. Um, it also only gives you indirect glimpses of the past so while a signal of a population event may in theory be archived in descendant populations, there can be um, more recent population events that obscure um, that signal. So in the Americas, European colonization was a huge, huge demographic event that really disrupted native populations and had devastating consequences for um, descendant communities. Um, and we still don't understand, fully understand all of the genetic impacts of European colonization on um, indigenous populations today. Um, that's an area of active research. That may have been one such population event that really, really interferes with our understanding of what happened in the past. So a more direct approach is to just sample genetic diversity of the time period of interest or close to it. But this also carries uh, ethical issues that need to be um, carefully considered um, because ancient DNA extractions are destructive when you, it, mostly, usually, almost always, when you try and get DNA out of a bone or some other kind of tissue, it destroys that sample. Um, and a lot of descendant communities are not okay with that. It's, uh, ancient DNA is also degraded, it's fragmented, um, there are fewer samples available, there are fewer spots in the genome or loci that you can look at. And it's extremely sensitive to modern contamination. So aside from exceptional cases, like the ones I'll be talking about today or what you read in Nature and Science, the majority of ancient samples have extremely poor preservation and you're very unlikely to get genetic information from any one sample. Um, so it's really tough to work in this field. Uh, so, yeah, these are some of the requirements that you have to have in order in a lab in order. This is actually our old lab. This is not our lab um, here at KU. This is my Utah lab where I postdoc and that's me. Um, so you have to work in a positively pressured space that has to be HEPA filtered. Uh, only certain people can go in the lab. You have to irradiate the lab, bleach everything, wear protective clothing. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, restrictions on what kinds of reagents you can use and so forth. Um, so, I, so ancient DNA does give you the benefit of directly observing genetic variability in the past. And so my preference is to, where possible, sample both ancient and contemporary um, genomes and try to use that to understand um, how populations change over time. Okay, so I study the populations of indigenous North Americans um, primarily because they're extremely poorly characterized genetically. So, whoops, go back one. So this map is out of date, but even, even today, this big blank spot is pretty much still there. We don't have a lot of genomes from contemporary populations in North America. We have a few ancient genomes, but not many. Um, and that is because there's a long history of troubled relationships between anthropological researchers and indigenous peoples. Um, there have been very exploited exploitive interactions um, and there's a strong um, atmosphere of distrust of researchers by indigenous peoples, um, especially in the United States. It's getting a little better because um, a lot of us are working very hard to build trust with communities, but, um, and, and we're, we're making progress on this, but it is a very slow process. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you guys are interested. Okay, so, since the time of European contact, Europeans have been absolutely European descended individuals have been absolutely fascinated by the origins of Native Americans. Um, they were people not mentioned in the Bible. And so Europeans, when they got to the Americas, were very confused about who these people were. Um, a whole lot of really wacky and frankly, really racist um, theories were developed to account for them. Again, I can talk about those more in the Q&A later if you're interested. 
But as the discipline of archaeology professionalized, um, models of Native American origins gradually emerged that linked them to Asia culturally, linguistically, technologically, um, and physically. For a long time, a relatively simple model of Native American origins held sway over the field of archaeology. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. And this model was appealing because it was simple and it made sense. Um, and because as the most recent continental colonization event of our species, we thought it would be a simple model. But um, as you'll see, additional archeological evidence and especially genetic evidence has completely changed our understanding of this event. And it turns out it was a very complex process, not a single event. Um, but I'll give you the old story first. So this is the old story, um, the one that you may have learned if you are my age or older. Um, this is known as the Clovis first model. And this model posited an entry for people into the Americas at the end of the Pleistocene. Um, the first peoples in the Americas were a group of mobile hunter gatherers who made and used a distinctive toolkit known as Clovis. And here's an example of the Clovis point. And according to this model, they entered the Americas across the Bering Land Bridge through an ice-free corridor that opened up between the Laurentine and the Cordilleran ice sheets and dispersed rapidly as far as South America in about a thousand years. And a corollary to the Clovis first model was the idea that massive extinctions of the giant American megafauna like the mastodonts, um, the dire wolves, the glyptodonts um, and others was caused by these Clovis hunters hunting too much. And this is known as the Clovis overkill hypothesis. So the Clovis first model was so entrenched in the archeological community for decades that it really hindered progress. Um, and people who proposed alternatives were treated very badly. And it's kind of a shameful period in archeology span in my opinion. Um, and it persisted for way longer than it should have. I even learned this model from my archeology span professor as an undergrad. Um, but there were real problems with the Clovis first model. And eventually these problems became too numerous to ignore. Um, my citations are not showing up on these images, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I do have citations for all my maps. I have not made any of these maps, but um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so genetics results helped a lot in toppling the barrier. So they showed us that the emergence of Native American specific genetic variation, that is genetic variation that we see in the Americas and nowhere else on earth, um, that this variation predated, emerged before Clovis. And Native American hap uh, haplogroups or, or mitochondrial lineages were recovered from coprolites um, in layers that predated Clovis at the Paisley Cave site, which is right here. So I'm gonna skip through a lot of history <laughs> right here, a lot of archeological history, but after prominent archeologists visited and accepted as legitimate um, the 14,200 year old site in Southern Chile known as Monteverde, which is right here, um, it opened the door to the acceptance of a number of, number of others. And I'm showing you a lot of sites in this image. I'm not gonna test you over them, don't worry. Um, some of the, these are all pre-Clovis sites. Some of them are quite controversial. Um, so there are, I've got sites here dating to 30,000 years ago, alongside sites that are uh, a little more conservative, you know, dating to um, 14,500 14, years ago, um, years before present, I should say. But, and also I should say better techniques and more Clovis sites have refined the age of the Clovis techno complex to between about 13,000 to 12,700 years ago, although some archeologists will argue with that. But. So regardless of which sites you accept as legitimate, um, and I'm a little bit agnostic on this because I'm not an archeologist, um, the pre-Clovis presence was firmly established. And this raises all kinds of new questions. Who were the first peoples in the Americas? If they weren't Clovis, who were they? And when did they get here? How did they get here? So as genetics has increasingly been applied to um, address these questions in recent years, it has gotten very complicated. So 
most important question that genetics is able to answer is who are the biological ancestors of Native Americans? And this question, again, as I said, was asked almost immediately as soon as Europeans began encountering indigenous peoples um, and coming up with ideas like they were the descendants of a lost tribe of Israel or the inhabitants of Atlantis or the children of giants. And there's all sorts of crazy ideas out there. But the first serious and correct explanation um, was proposed by the Jesuit, I believe, prior um, Jose de Acosta in 1590. And he suggested that Native Americans originated from the migration of people across an as yet undiscovered land connection between Asia and North America. Um, and he was right. <laughs> so uh, 20th century physical anthropologists studied Native American genetic diversity using what we call classical markers, um, which was very advanced for the time, but blood group, serum protein, um, enzyme polymorphisms. Um, and these studies confirmed the Asian, Asian origins of Native Americans. They had already been confirmed by physical, like um, skeletal morphology, dental morphology and archeology, span but now we could confirm them genetically as well. But these markers, these genetic systems offered a very crude resolution um, on evolutionary and historical questions. So since then, and again, these images are quite out of date, but um, <laughs> advances in molecular technologies have enabled researchers to look directly at DNA sequences and compare the lineages of Native Americans populations in contemporary and ancient groups. Um, so I'm gonna summarize the uh, insights we gained from these approaches focusing mainly on what we've learned from whole genomes because that's the most recent, the most up-to-date stuff. So the first insight that we've learned from these studies is that the first peoples of the Americas have reduced genetic diversity compared to other populations around the world. So in population genetics, the founder effect is um, describes what happens when a new population is formed, here's the new population from a small, number of individuals from a larger parent population. And this new population will have genetic, reduced genetic diversity um, with respect to the old population, right? Because it's just a subsampling. And it may then be subjected to genetic drift and selection um, and new mutations, which results in significant differences um, in the new population genetically from its parent population. And we see this in all the genetic systems of Native Americans, but um, it's perhaps easiest and, and, and most, um, it's easiest to appreciate in mitochondrial lineages or um, so the mitochondrial maternal lineages of Native Americans. Uh, I've listed them here. You don't have to worry about what they are exactly, but um, these are the, the mitochondrial lineages present in Native Americans and their parent lineages of these, of these mitochondrial DNA lineages are found in Southern Siberia. So this fits the definition of a founder effect. And so we hypothesize that a limited number of founder um, genetic diversity was present in the original population that gave rise to Native Americans. Um, and it was originally on the basis of mitochondrial DNA assumed that this population was from Southern Siberia because that's where we see these lineages common today. Turns out that's not the full story. And one of the things that ancient DNA has taught us again and again and again is that present day patterns of genetic variation do not necessarily reflect what was present in the past. People move around, populations change, evolution happens. So that's why you should always be cautious about DNA tests that tell you where your ancestors came from, because unless they've got really good um, uh, data dating back to the time when your ancestors would have been there, may not be true. Okay, so um, archeological and genetic evidence for an Asian and specifically Siberian um, origin of Native Americans was established. And the route was most likely the land connection between Siberia and North America known as Beringia. So we, we have that. In the last decade, we've gotten complete ancient genomes. And this is due to a number of technical developments that are really amazing. Um, 
So I'm going to take you through the events as we understand them today, chronologically, in the order which they actually happened, not in the order in which we discovered them, because um, this can be confusing. <laughs> so we're going to be jumping backwards and forwards in time with regard to the scientific papers. Um, but we'll be moving more or less steadily forward from about 31,000 years ago to the present day. Um, and I'll try to put up, I put up images of the relevant papers so you can take a look at them if you want. Um, and to keep you oriented, I'm gonna keep the date more or less where we're at down at the right-hand side of the screen and um, lower right-hand side and the site that we're talking about or the region at the lower left um, side of the screen. Um, also, I don't remember where I got this map from, so I'm sorry, I'm not citing it. Okay, so we're first gonna talk about the, actually, let me go back one slide, the Yana rhinoceros horn site, which is right here. Actually, it's a collection of sites, right? Very far north. Um, and this is the place where the, we have the earliest evidence for anatomically modern humans in Northeast Siberia, dating to about 31,600 years ago. And this site is remarkable for several reasons. So first, it's got wonderful examples of upper Paleolithic culture. There's some examples of some beautiful stone tools, um, jewelry, art, it's really amazing. And second, the sites that make up Yana, um, here's another kind of a close in image here, um, show clear evidence of year round occupation, which means people were living permanently this far north 30, over 30,000 years ago. That is kind of amazing because at this point in human evolutionary history, they would not have had physical adaptations to cold. They would have had, uh, they were still, they would still have had their, um, their adaptations for an African environment. So their ability to live this far north would have been due to technological and cultural adaptations, including things like the ability to make complex machines like snares to exploit smaller animals, um, and also especially making sewing needles, eyed sewing needles, um, which is kind of an amazing technological development because it allowed them to tailor, make tailored clothing. And as far as we know, our archaic relatives, Neanderthals and Denisovans could not make tailored clothing, which we think is maybe why they didn't live this far north. So Yana is also special because it sits squarely within Beringia. And if people were living in Beringia over 30,000 years ago, could they have been the ancestral populations to Native Americans? This is a question that has been, we've been curious about for a long time. Luckily, recently, um, we've gotten genomes, not me, we as the field, um, have gotten genomes from two baby teeth that were found um, on the banks of the Yana River at one of the Yana sites. Um, and they date to over 30,000 years ago. Um, the cool thing about these teeth is that, so in this, field, in this field, we talk a lot about dead babies. We have a lot of dead children, a lot of dead babies, genomes from these remains. It's really depressing actually. But these are not from dead kids. <laughs> they're actually from 10 year olds and they're lost naturally when the ones that are lost when you, when you turn around 10, 10, 11 years old. So this means that these were lost during the normal course of life. And that means these kids were living at least that long at this, this latitude this long ago. Um, and that's really cool because that tells us something about their lives. And it also, it means they survived infancy and early childhood. Um, and the genomes are also important because they show us they were from two boys who were unrelated to each other. This means, and you can use, um, these genomes to estimate using math, the, uh, the effective population size of the populations they come from. Um, and the effective population size of these two boys population was something they would have had at least 500 individuals and that's breeding individuals. So it means the actual population would have been much larger, maybe a thousand, maybe 2000, it's hard to say when you factor in people who didn't have children. So this shows us that the ancient population in this region, because th the boys were unrelated. So this population was very mobile. They exchanged mar marriage partners with other groups. They were sizable. They were living permanently above the, you know, that above high latitudes. They were thriving. This is a really important population with, with great arts. And it tells us a lot about the upper Paleolithic 
So the Yana children have Y chromosome lineages that are ancestral to Native Americans. But when you look at their entire genomes, it turns out that they were related to many present day populations across the Americas and Northern Eurasia. So this is ancient, their descendants were likely very widespread. One of the populations that was descended directly from the Yana group was discovered through sequencing the remains of a little toddler, again, super depressing, um, from another site called Malta, which is right here, and it dates to 24,000 years ago. Malta's genome showed us that his, it was another little boy, his population, um, which geneticists call ancient North Eurasians, was ancestral, both to Native Americans and also to Western Eurasians and Europeans. So um, his population, and this should be North Eurasians, I don't know why it says North Siberians, but anyway, his population intermarried with a group of ancient East Asians sometime around 25 to 20,000 years ago, just before the start of the last glacial maximum. And out of this meeting and this intermarriage emerges the population that gives rise to Native Americans. And we tend to call them the Beringians um, because we, a lot of us, assume they were living in Beringia. Um, but we don't really actually have a very clear idea of where this interaction, this, merit, this intermarriage occurred, where these guys lived, where this population emerged. Um, we assume, geneticists, most of us, assume that this happened in Beringia because they were isolated. Their, gene their genomes show us that there was a long period of isolation, several thousand years of the ancestors of Native Americans. Um, and we speculate that this may have had something to do with the fact that they were living during a harsh climactic event, the last glacial maximum. All genetic studies have emphatically ruled out a European source for pre 1492 ancestry of Native Americans. So any of that stuff you hear about Salutrians coming across the Atlantic or any of that, no, <laughs> no, it's not true. At least genetically, there's no evidence for that. Okay, so this brings us to the second stage of um, the genetic history of Native Americans, which we tend to call the Beringian pause or the standstill or isolation. So we've known for many years that mitochond from mitochondrial DNA that the ancestors of Native Americans were isolated um, for some period of time, either you know between like five, some people have estimated as many as 20,000 years, although no, not that long it turns out, but uh, before they dispersed into the Americas. And during this period, the ancestral population stayed genetically cohesive long enough for mutations to arise which we see in Native American populations, but nowhere else in the world. So many of us infer that this pause must have taken place in Beringia itself, somewhere probably along the southern margin of central Beringia um, in one or more refugia during the harsh climactic conditions of the LGM. Paleoclimactic reconstructions have shown us that the southern margin of central Beringia would have been a relatively decent place to live. So there would have been relatively warmer temperatures, higher plant productivity, presumably birds, marine mammals, fish, there would have been plenty to eat there. Um, but we don't actually, I need to stress this, have any direct evidence of people living there because most of this is underwater today. Um, and we can't really go there and look for archeological sites. On the Western side of Beringia, the only sites that date to well before the LGM are Yana, um, or well after people are already in the Americas. So they don't really tell us much. Um, Beringi, uh, basically all of Siberia was abandoned during the LGM. It just was completely depopulated. There's no archeological record during the LGM in this period, in this region. There are also no sites that have been definitively attributed to upper Paleolithic peoples in Eastern Beringia, although there's some tantalizing possibilities. So a study of lake core sediments uh, from this site right here, Lake E5 on the North Slope of Alaska, contains fecal biomarkers, human fecal biomarkers that date to 31,000 to 22,000 years ago. So we're all excited about this, although a lot of archaeologists are a little more skeptical. It's not verified with any other evidence. Um, there's another site here called Bluefish Caves, which is in the northern Yukon. 
um, has some faunal remains, which have what look like maybe butchery marks on them um, that date to between 24 to 22,000 years ago. Most of the archeologists I know are pretty skeptical of this though. So there's really not much evidence yet to support the Beringian incubation happening in Beringia. The oldest site in Alaska dates to about 14,000 years ago. So that's Swan Point, which is right here. And there are a cluster of other sites that date to shortly after 14,000 years ago. And simultaneously, a little bit after 14,000 years ago, we see the appearance of archaeological sites back in Siberia. Um, and I won't get into the details, but these sites on either side of the Bering Strait have clear archaeological similarities. Like it's very clear there's interactions going on back and forth. So these sites don't really tell us much about, in my opinion, about Native American origins. Um, so we're missing direct archaeological evidence of the Beringian source population. And this has led some archaeologists to understandably argue that the Beringian pause was not in Beringia, it was somewhere else, perhaps in East Asia, where we have evidence of people living in refugia there. Um, but myself and most geneticists take issue with this because we say when you have populations living near each other, they have sex with each other. Um, and we don't see any evidence of this. We see very clear genetic evidence of isolation of the ancestors of Native Americans. So we think it's more likely that they must have been geographically separated from other populations. And you know, right now, this looks like a great place. Um, although I know some people who argue they might've been up here. So who knows? That is an area of active research. So stay tuned, maybe we'll find out sometime. Okay, so as the population ancestral to Native Americans was undergoing this isolation period, it was also undergoing a fissioning period. So lots of little populations were splitting off, it looks like. And the more genomes we sequence from Native Americans, especially ancient ones, the more of these cryptic little populations we're discovering. And um, I'm gonna kind of just tell you about one of them, but just understand there's a couple of others. This one group, which is sort of confusingly called the ancient Beringians, I don't know why they named them that, lived apparently throughout Northern Alaska. And um, it's this Upward Sun River site. We know about it from the Upward Sun River site, um, which I can't actually, let me see if I can move this. Okay, it's, I don't actually have it marked here, but the Upward Sun River site is like in here somewhere. Um, and this, group, um, so it included these children whose genomes, we published the mitochondrial DNA a number of years before this, but the, their full genomes were published um, in this paper. And um, they were buried, let's see, do I have a, I don't have a figure for this, sorry. Um, they were actually buried in um, a couple of children buried underneath a house, which is actually quite common. Um, and their genomes we, there was a complete genome was obtained from one of them and the dates to 11,500 years ago. So after the Beringian incubation, but they belonged to a population that was very distinctive from other Native Americans. They were descendants of the Beringians, but they were their own group. And they seem to have given rise to a large-ish population that lived in Alaska while the ancestors of other Native Americans moved southward. So um, let's see what else did I want to tell you about that. Yeah, so the only thing we do know <laughs> is that these groups, these Beringians, these different Beringian populations did not move southward into the Americas because North America was completely blocked by a, a giant ice sheet, right? So they were stuck there. They were stuck, could not move any farther into the Americas. Okay, so this brings us kind of to the third Oh, sorry, uh, this is another image I was gonna show you. Here's the ancient Beringian population. May have split off here, may have split off here. We don't really know. Um, we don't have any uh, archeological ground truthing evidence for this. So it's kind of an area of active research. So this brings us to the next stage of genetic history of Native Americans, which is when exactly did people move out of Beringia and disperse through the continents? Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we have pretty solid evidence of archeological presence in the Americas by 14,500 years ago, maybe 15,000 years ago, that's really solid. 
There are some other sites that are accepted by some, but not all archaeologists, that date to 15 to 16,000 years ago. I mean, they look good to me too, but I'm not an archaeologist, so I have to stay agnostic, I guess. Um, and then there's some sites, putative sites, that predate 16,000 years ago, get really, really old. We have some claim to be 100,000 right, which would put them in the realm of archaic humans, not anatomically modern homo sapiens. So um, I won't get into that uh, right now for lack of time, but we can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. So I'm going to focus on what the genetics says about when people got here and what routes they may have taken, because genetics actually does give us some insights into this. So an extremely important genome that has told us a lot about both of these questions comes from a Clovis era site called Anzic in Montana. And the Anzic site is super important because it's the only known site that contains a burial. Um, it was a Clovis burial that, and it was a, a, a small boy, probably about one or two years old, who was buried with over 115 artifacts. Here are some of them. They're pretty amazing. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, actually, these are just examples. These are not the artifacts that were buried with him, but um, he was covered with red ochre, which is a red powder that's uh, um, uh, symbolic, ritualistic. And he was dated to between 12,700 and 12,500 years ago. And his genome was sequenced by the daughter of the landowners of the site he was found on. Um, her name is Sarah Anzik, and she happened to be a geneticist. And so she worked with ancient DNA researchers to sequence his genome. And Anzik's genome showed that all the all Native Americans, besides the ancient Beringians who stayed in Alaska, but all the other Native Americans were descended from two groups. So there's basically two major branches of Native Americans. The Northern Native Americans, which are abbreviated NNA, um, and I've got them indicated right here. And the Southern Native Americans, which are abbreviated SNA. And Anzic, this is kind of confusing. The terminology is a little confusing. Anzic, even though he's up north in Montana, belonged to the SNA branch. Um, we don't have a great understanding of the, the complete geographic distribution of SNA because we don't have a lot of genomes from the United States. But uh, we know that everybody in South, Central and South America, and probably most um, indigenous peoples of North America belong to the SNA branch. And those who belong to the NNA branch um, are the Algonquians, the Nadine, Salishan, and Shimson speakers from Canada. So it's, it's a relatively um, small grouping of people. So we see that there's this tremendous genetic structure that occurs. And using um, dating tech, genetic dating techniques, we can estimate when this structure arose. And the estimate is between 17,500 and 14,600 years ago. As we get more genomes, we'll probably be able to refine that date to be a little more useful. Um, so a paper that came out in 2018 reported the sequencing of more ancient genomes, a ton more, from Alaska all the way through Chile. And it addressed a number of other questions regarding this. So they found that the most likely model to explain the patterns of genetic variation that they observed put the split of SNA and NNA south of the ice sheets um, because they're equally related to ancient Beringians. If one had moved first, then the other one would have continued having sex with ancient Beringians and they would have been more closely related, right? So it's the same idea. But they're both branches are equally related. So um, they think, these, these authors believe, that the split between SNA and NNA occurred south of the ice sheets. But this is a bit controversial and you know, it, people are arguing about that. Um, okay, so paleoclimactic reconstructions show us that there would have been two basic routes into the Americas. So the first, um, if you recall, the Clovis first model suggested that people entered the Americas down an ice-free corridor between the two um, ice masses. And um, I think that the Currently, you guys may know this better than I do, but the best estimates for when the corridor would have been completely open would have been at least by 13,000 years ago, possibly as early as 14,900 years ago. Um, the oldest archeological evidence for human presence in the corridor dates to about 12,400 years ago. The West Coast is the other possible route. 
And that would have become deglaciated much earlier. So at least by 16,000 years ago, possibly as early as 17,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so which, which route was the first? That's, that's a big question. We see two things genetically that give us some clues. So the first is that we see an extremely rapid genetic diversification over time. Um, once that NNA and SNA split, we see populations going doo -doo 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 -doo, splitting really fast um, in time. And this signal has been characterized by some geneticists as, I'm, I'm gonna quote them, akin to leapfrogging across large portions of the diverse intervening so I and others interpret this as evidence more consistent with a coastal migration via boat, because you can travel a lot faster using boats than you can um, walking over land. Um, another piece of evidence comes from uh, environmental DNA taken from lake sediment cores in the middle of the, um, the ice-free corridor region. And that shows that the interior route may have been open, but nothing was living there. Nothing was growing there. Um, it wasn't viable um, until about 12,600 years ago, which would then after Clovis was already in the Americas, like after people were already in the Americas. So I think there needs to be more uh, evidence and more, more exploration of this um, hypothesis. But right now, my interpretation is that a coastal route is much more likely, much faster, and much more fitting with the um, archaeological and genetic environmental evidence. Okay, so I think, based on all this, you guys can hopefully see that the peopling of the Americas was a far, far more complicated process than we previously envisioned. And ancient DNA has really done a lot to reveal this complexity it's kind of frustrating because we get new genomes sequenced every year. And because there are still relatively few genomes, this means one genome makes a huge impact. And so things get changed constantly. Um, and it's hard even for me to keep up and I do this for a living. Um, so I just wanna kind of summarize what I see as currently the most reasonable summary of what we think we know. And this is gonna change in like six months, I swear. Um, so right now, <laughs> All our evidence shows us that the ancestors of Native Americans were East Asians um, and ancestors ancient North Eurasians, and that they got to the Americas um, via a multi-stage process, isolation, possibly in Beringia, possibly somewhere else, during which time there was a diversification into multiple related but distinctive populations, and then a migration into the Americas, probably along a coastal route, and a diversification into a very genetically structured population. And I kind of want to close by talking about some emerging areas of research, some unresolved issues. So one other areas that need a lot of attention are, um, so we have a lot of research on the peopling of the Americas genetically. We have some inkling about how people got here, but less is understood about what happened after people got here. How did they learn the landscape? How did they develop adaptations to different environments, new environments? Um, how did the populations change over time? That is much less understood and something that I, I'm really interested in. Um, and uh, this is just uh, mitochondrial data that shows us that we see consistency in populations in some region over time, but in other regions, we see lots of replacements and migrations. So, um, you know, we have to explore this with, with whole genomes um, a lot. One very surprising finding that has emerged in the last few, um, few years from studies of genome-wide markers is a signal of low level affinity between some Amazonian populations and Australomelanesians. And this is really interesting and is not super well explained right now. Um, it's only a tiny part of the genomes of some South American populations and um, Right now, we have, if you, for technical reasons, which I won't get into, this is called population Y, um, it does not look like this is uh, the result of a trans-Pacific migration. The genetic signal does not match what we would expect. So more likely there is, this is the result of gene flow um, into the Beringian populations from 
shared ancestors with uh, Australomelanesians when they were in Asia. Um, I'm actually going to X this one out because I don't think this is true anymore. So, okay. So finally, I want to return to and highlight again an ethical issue that's really hindered our research, which is the lack of participation of Native Americans in, especially in the United States, in genomic studies. And this is true in uh, studies about looking at ancestry and history, but also true of biomedical studies as well. And this is really directly attributable to a lack of trust um, because of the sometimes extremely outrageous treatment of Native Americans by scientists. Um, so there's a growing effort to improve this situation. Um, and we're actually seeing, um, and I, you know, and I can tell you a bit more about this if you're interested, but some really good partnerships developing with indigenous communities. Um, and so I think that what we're gonna see is um, big changes in the next coming years um, where we have uh, instances of uh, researchers respecting the interests, the sovereignty of indigenous communities and making them equal partners instead of you know, research subjects. Um, so that's always good. And that's with that, I'll just say, thank you guys. That's all I've got. <laughs> and I'm happy to take your questions. I have one. See, I mean, you, they... um, you, me you mentioned a coastal route. Yeah. Um, is there any signs that there would have been sort of a continental shelf there that maybe there's things that we can't find because it's on the water? Yes, that's a great question. So, uh, okay, I am not a geologist, but the geologists tell me that there is um, there are two things. A lot of those regions are underwater that would have direct evidence. So that's a problem. We need submarines or something. I don't know how they do that. But another problem, uh, but another, um, there's some hope because some of the coastal rat regions that would have been there during that time period, instead of being submerged when the glaciers melted and the, and the sea levels rose, when the glaciers melted, the, there's isostatic rebound, right? And so they went higher instead of lower, below water. You guys know that more than I do. I'm not a geologist. But so archaeologists are looking for those places and they're starting to really scrutinize those, those coastal areas. So great question. I don't think they found anything yet, but that they're looking. I got a question. You you can say they're not from Europe, but there's some fun artifacts and ancient stone tools from the eastern side, most common the eastern side of America. According to a journey to 10,000 BC, when they think they're from the European, and the stone was made differently than the Asian. Yeah, they're, it turns out, no, they're not from Europe. <laughs> it's a very, very, very fringe uh, group of archaeologists who are claiming that. The majority of the archaeological community, um, they were made, so they're made, oh boy, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm definitely not a lithics person, but I'll do my best. They were, the, the connection has been made by some archaeologists, very few, um, between those tools that you're talking about and uh, the Salutrian culture, um, in Europe, <clears throat> and they argue that because both culture, both tool types are, are made using a sp specific type of flaking known as overshot flaking, a specific technological approach, that this means that the one is ancestral to the other. Um, and that has been really, really thoroughly debunked. It's really an example of um, convergent evolution, of people just doing things the same way because there's only so many ways you can make tools. Um, we're really, really good at looking for patterns and seeing them, but um, it takes uh, archaeologists who work in this field have a very high level of rigor where they'll be like, oh, no. Um, the other, for me, the more compelling argument is that the, um, there's no evidence of genetic. There's no genetic evidence, zero, zilch, no European ancestry in Native Americans prior to, to um, European contact. And if they brought those tools over if they descended from Europeans, there would have been gene flow as well. I mean, people have what we do. So there would have been, we would have found it by now. I'm, I'm really convinced, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But the archeologists are, are pretty adamant that there is no ancestral descendant relationship between these tools. So all the genetics that you're working on, is this all mitochondrial? No, no, we work on whole genomes too. So, yeah. hmm. 
So how far back can you go with autosomal DNA? And the reason I ask is that I'm one of these people who has done a DNA test and worked in my family history. And, and I can go back um, at least 16 generations in, in some of the, and, and when I do, uh, when I do this on Ancestry and they, they look at certain markers and they say, oh, look, you've got a marker from the South Pacific. I think, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like you said, people travel. And so you're trying to match up populations. But you also showed a site that was over in uh, Finland, I think, based on the name of it, I'd say, that I, I think was, uh, it was one of these very fringe sites. Um, I'm guessing it was, it was you know, 12 or 14,000 years old. And so I, I wondered, I know that the Sami people of, uh, of uh, Northern Scandinavia are um, from Asia. They brought their culture and their language over. And, um, and the, the Finnish language is also from Asia. And so I wondered for people who are of Scandinavian heritage, like me, um, could we really have any autosomal markers that would link with a, a Northern uh, Siberian uh, ancestor? Yeah, okay, so you're getting outside my area, of course. I don't do European genetics whatsoever. Or, um, so, um, or well, Scandinavian genetics. But what I can tell you is we can, we can look at these ancestral populations that are upper Paleolithic and say, okay, yeah, you're descended from them, right? So we can look at Malta, we can look at um, uh, uh, Yana and say, all right, we see that these are ancestral to a very broad swath of people, right? But as far as like pinpointing specifically, you are a descendant of this ancient individual, that, that span of time, no, probably not. We can say you have a same shared mitochondrial lineage or you have a shared Y chromosome lineage, but probably lots of people have those as well. Um, I always tell people to be super cautious about your, well, take with a grain of salt what the ancestry testing companies tell you, because there are a lot of assumptions made when they interpret your results. Um, one of the things that you should always keep in mind is that in general, unless they're very, um, unless they say they're doing this, which they rarely do, they're almost certainly comparing your genetic variation to that of present day populations. And so we can say you share genetic markers with these populations in these different regions of the world. Again, that does not mean that that's where your ancestors came from, right? If you go back um, just a few generations, it's, it's actually surprisingly few generations where you get to the last common ancestor of everybody alive today. Shocking, because there is so much gene flow, right? Um, and if you're interested in this, I can recommend a really, really good book for you to read. Um, which is called um, A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived by Adam Rutherford. It is like the best book you could read on this. And he explains it all super, super carefully, and as well as the limitations of ancestry testing. So I will refer you to a, more of an expert than I am on that. Anyone else? I see, I see some questions in the, in the chat here. Um, you mentioned ancient DNA is highly subjective to contamination. Yes, sucks. How much does this contamination affect the research and possibly alter the results of the research? Okay, so yes, there, um, ancient contamination is the bane of our existence um, and why I have to dress up like I do. Well, actually, I don't get to work in the lab anymore. My students don't let me, but I used to have to dress up and all that stuff to go work in the lab. Um, so we have all these precautions that we take against <laughs> contamination. Um, it has altered the results of the research quite a bit in the past. Um, if you are not extremely careful in being able to tell you have contamination or not, right? And we do that with use of negative controls and a lot of things to detect it. But recently, because we have um, technological advances in, in data analysis, so bioinformatics, it lets us actually distinguish between ancient molecules and present day molecules. And that's because ancient molecules have characteristic damage patterns. Like we expect to see damage on the ends. We, we see these patterns and we know what to look for. Whereas modern molecules, DNA molecules don't have those. And so you can actually bioinformatically sort out contaminants from modern. And they're almost always contaminants, but you can actually exclude those from your analyses. It's really cool. 
Um, don't ask me how, I don't, that's not my, I can't explain it, but they do that. Um, and so contamination is, is, is always a problem, but we can, actually, we can actually eliminate it from the analyses more or less. So um, it's a great question. Uh, another question, similarities in tool technologies, bifaces, Clovis people and Neanderthals, could there been some genetic connection between them? Well, yes, there is a genetic conne uh, connection between Neanderthals and Clovis peoples. There's a genetic connection between Neanderthals and all non, all people who have ancestry out of Africa. And that's because Neanderthals and anatomically modern Homo sapiens interbred multiple times. And everybody who has any European ancestry has some Neanderthal ancestry. The similarities between their tool technologies though, um, are not great. <laughs> so probably not the result of genetics. There's an enormous time difference between them. And uh, actually Salutrian uh, blades are infinitely more sophisticated than the Neanderthal bifaces. Biface just means, and, and we're getting into archeology span here again, not my specialty, but as I understand it, biface just means a stone that's been worked on both sides, right? So a lot of tools are bifaces, but that's a great question. Uh, how do you reconcile genetic evidence of passage through Beringia 13,000 years ago with archaeological evidence of older habitation in South America? Another great question. So first, I think people, genetic evidence shows passage through Beringia way earlier than 13,000, right? It's more like they were in Beringia 25,000 years ago, right? Um, and they didn't, and they got into the Americas maybe sometime between 17 and 15,000 years ago, okay? But the older sites in South America, the 30,000 year old sites, that is fascinating. Again, not an archeologist. I leave it to the archeologists to evaluate the archeological evidence. I try to keep an open mind though, right? So could we imagine a scenario in which those are, if we assume for argument's sake, those are real sites that there are actually people there. How do we reconcile that with the genetic evidence? I don't know. Um, we are trying, the geneticists are trying to come up with, with models that could explain it. So far, they're not compatible with our existing genetic evidence. Now, does that mean they're not true? No, it could be they're true. Um, it could be that there are people who were living there earlier and they, again, didn't leave a genetic contribution to Native Americans. Or maybe they did, but we haven't sampled that yet, right? Um, but I kind of have to work with what we have genetically, right? I can't speculate about hypothetical evidence that we don't have. Um, and so what I say right now is that genetic evidence is not compatible with that, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have been true. It just means we have to, you know, be cautious. Also the archeologists who I talked to, you know, some, some think they're, they look like real sites. Others say that the tools, the tools they find there could have been made by natural geological processes that they're not real convincing human made tools, right? So archeologists have a lot of um, standards that they apply and you kind of get different um, interpretations of the archeological record depending on how, you know, how stringent your standards are. Um, so again, I am trying to be agnostic on this. Um, but. Thanks for that. So, so I asked the question. Um, yeah. And and sorry for getting the detail wrong there, but but wasn't the genetic evidence or, or maybe it was the archaeological evidence of you know the passage um, at the split between the two ice sheets, mm -hmm. right? So so you had people in Beringia, yeah, much earlier yeah, than yeah. thirteen thousand years ago. But isn't the evidence that the kind of movement of peoples through the early? ice yeah through the ice sheet corridor yeah it would have been late, but it could have been a quick. An earlier movement down the coast, right? right so right, that's okay. what I, I mean. I'm really sold on the coastal migration. <laughs> I really think it's so, much more solid than. Um, but could people have gotten here before the formation of the ice sheets? That's a really interesting question. I don't know. I don't right. know. Yeah, that's really. I mean, maybe. But again, there's only so much. So so far back you can go. Um, before you're, you know, predating the migration of people into Siberia, right? I mean, by people, I mean anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So then we're moving into archaic, um, cut our archaic cousins, and you know, I find that less convincing. Um, there's a site in California that you guys may have heard of because it was actually published in Nature um, 
And uh, it was dated to 100,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's very good. I don't think it's very convincing. The evidence is the people who wrote the paper were not the ones who excavated the site. They found artifacts, artifacts, they found the, the tools, stone, sorry, they found stones. Whether they're tools or not, again, archaeologists argue, right? Because it's really easy to convince yourself. If you pick up a rock and it, it's got, you know, chips off of it, how do you know that a human did that versus natural geological processes? That's a really tough one, especially if you're assuming that you know, this is really a long time ago and the tool making processes were quite simple, right? They're just knocking flakes off, right? Not shaping them into bifaces, not shaping them into elaborate Clovis tools. And um, the tool tools that they found at this site called Sarudi are really, they look like rocks. They look like, geo, we call them geofacts. You guys probably already know that. Um, and some of the other pieces of evidence they have are kind of explainable by the movement of construction equipment across the site before it was excavated. You know, there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of squishiness, right? So most archeologists I know are, don't find these super early sites to be very convincing. They're, I'll just put it, the, the standard of evidence has to be really extraordinary. And, and mm. this papers like this are not really, don't really meet them in most people's opinions. But I would be happy to be wrong. It would be so cool if we had archaic hominins living in North America 100,000 years ago. That'd be awesome. So Agreed. I just want to see more evidence for that. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question also. Mm -hmm. um, I got a little involved with Meadowcroft mm -hmm. and uh, out of ACO, who did the work or had to, headed the work was arguing that there was material found that dated to 18,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he first did this about, oh, let's say 40 years ago, 35 years ago with the carbon dating, he was attacked as everything you can think of, which is what most archeologists do. Uh, but that dating of 18,000 years ago predates much of all of the argument about the natives coming to America. Um, is there a justification for really early coming, the 25,000, the 30,000? And those were the people that kind of settled much of North America, followed by those who came with the Beringia bit uh, 13,000 years ago? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question, right? Um, and I know Jim, I, I like Jim a lot, he's great. Um, and he was treated terribly. Um, so maybe, so one of the old, old ideas in physical anthropology is that the very, when you look at the, the, the crania, the skulls of the very earliest skeletons we have in the Americas, they look differently, the shape, they're shaped differently than that of subsequent layer Native Americans. I don't buy it. Um, we have genomes from those oldest Native Americans, including Kennewick Man, the ancient one, including Anzig, including, you know, um, Naya, like all of the earliest skeletons that have the cranial shape that have yielded DNA look exactly the same genetically as other Native Americans. Um, as for the dating, is it possible though that we have people here prior to the descendants of the Beringians, right? Um, who uh, just didn't leave genetic traces? I mean, yeah, that's possible. Um, I, I am a geneticist though, and I like to see genetic data, right? So that's where I build my models. It's all about what evidence do you prioritize, right? And we don't have any skeletons from them. We don't have any remains. We don't have any, you know, nothing tangible like that. Um, Meadowcroft is a really interesting site. And I think I would love to see more work done at that site because I think it's one of the solidly pre-Clovis sites. Um, and right. it, it, deserves more, it deserves more attention. It deserves more, um, you know, recognition. Well, I mean, I think it's recognized. Like we talk about it a lot, but it's just, 
The problem is the dating at Meadowcroft was done so early, so long ago, as you know, that our, our dating methods have gotten so much better and more refined that I'm wondering if it wouldn't be worthwhile going back and redating those, those layers and seeing, you know, can we get a much, with our newer techniques and our better techniques, you know, where does it fall today, right? Is it actually 18,000? I think 18,000 is fine. I think we can work with 18,000 in the Beringian incubation, expansion. I think that's, it's on the upper end of things, but I don't think it's precluded by these models at all. Um, but is it actually 18,000 or is it more like 17,000, you know, falling in line with some of the other early pre clovis sites that we see in North America? I think it's fine. I think it could fit with that. I don't think the 30,000, I don't think the 100,000 year old sites can really fit with that. And so that I don't, we got to do more with that, right? We got to do more to, to, to demonstrate that. That's, that's kind of how I feel about it. But you ask any archeologist and they'll give you a different answer, right? Like all the archeologists, yeah, I, I have tried because I'm writing a book about this right now. And I have gone through and I've interviewed every North American archaeologist I can, I can get on the phone and ask them, what pre-Clovis sites do you accept? Which ones are the good ones? Which ones do you think that fall short? And every single one of them gives me a different answer. So, you know, it's hard. That actually, <laughs> it's I, hard. I think of any group of people that is oh, mentally locked into their theory of I believe it's this, so everybody else in the world is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the archaeologists. Yeah, you know, I think they've gotten better, um, at least since I was in school, um, because, well, I think genetics really threw them for a loop. And I think that we also have a lot more younger archaeologists, you know, who are much more open minded. And we have some really great sites, you know, like, um, just there's some really, really solid, good pre clovis sites. And I think that's really shaken and it's kind of things up a bit, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to see. And you use DNA from other sources. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, um, I've, I've read about uh, DNA extraction from soil. And now yeah. that there's, now that there's uh, big data, you can filter out the, the sequences that don't belong to uh, to humans and and uh, and do that and or even even from uh, from microbes or other organisms that uh, mm -hmm. be useful. great question absolutely um, in fact our lab is doing that a little bit um, that well I don't want to say I'm not supposed to say never mind we have sampled a few sites I will I will leave it at that um, but uh, for example the the dating of the viability of the ice free corridor. Um, that was done by Pedersen et al. in 20, I don't know, 14 or something. And that was done using environmental DNA and looking at, okay, when in this, so they take a big soil core, right, from the lake that's right in the middle of the ice tree corridor, and they go to those layers, right? And they're like, where do we see, where do we first see um, evidence of vegetation? Where do we first see evidence of, of animals, right? They didn't get human DNA, but, you know, where do we see that? And it's like sterile, 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 sterile until you hit you know, like 13,000 or something. So that, you know, is very useful. I, I'm not sure one study is enough. I think we need to do it all, multiple cores all up and down the corridor, but, you know, that's certainly interesting. And there's a lot more work being done along those lines, but um, it, it has, I don't think a lot of it's been published yet. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> I, you had mentioned that the Yana people 31,000 years ago were, you were surprised that they were there, that they were physiologically not adapted to that, that cold, mm -hmm. or is it so much the cold at, or the lower light levels? I, I guess what would their, would their pigmentation, would that have changed by that time? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Would they have been darker skin? I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. I guess what um, adaptations were you thinking they would have? Um... I was thinking of Bergman's and Allen's rules. Do we have any anthropology nerds here who know what that is? Um, so Bergman's and Allen's rules are observations um, done by physical anthropologists that as you, populations who live farther away from the equator, you know, farther northern latitudes, um, tend to be adapted for cold by having more um, squatter bodies with shorter limbs. Right, and those are those that reduces surface area um, and and preserves a. Hi. <laughs> it's kind of like the same with the whale effect. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so it, 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 um, it, it's, a, it's for preserving heat, right? Um, whereas right. populations that live closer to the equator tend to be very uh, lanky, thin, um, with long limbs, and that's good for dispersing heat, right? And so we see this in populations that have been, you know, living in a region for many, many generations, right? It takes time to adapt. These are pretty big morphological transformations, but, um, but the people who would have lived at Yana would have been adapted, would not have had, looked like Arctic peoples today, right? They would have been lanky and, and, and thin and have long, long limbs, right? So, and presumably they also would not have, so there's a researcher who's doing some really interesting um, work. Her name is Leslie Lusko. And she's doing some really interesting looking, looking at vitamin D adaptations, which kind of gets to what you're at, we're talking about. But she's looking at it in the context of breast milk and looking at um, the, this particular genetic variant that we see in Arctic peoples um, that influences, she thinks, maybe vitamin D adaptation absorption from breast milk. And of course, vitamin D being very, very important to get at these higher latitudes. And she thinks that this genetic adaptation, which arose maybe during the Beringian incubation, she thinks maybe um, is, is adaptive for absorbing more vitamin D out of breast milk. So it's really interesting work. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have questions? Let me ask, uh, would it be possible for you to write a short article with a couple or three pictures or flat slides or whatever uh, for our newsletter? Oh, sure. It just depends on when. I'm working right now on an article for Scientific American about this exact topic. So I got to get that done first and it's due next week, but, <laughs> which I'm not ready to turn it in yet. Uh, but, but, you know, if, if you don't need it by next week and can give me a little time, I could get it for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm editor of the newsletter. And that's okay, yeah, I'd be happy to. Just let me know when you need it by and how long it needs to be. <laughs> well, we're cutting back a little bit on the volume. So something the order of a couple pages plus of a written text plus, you know, five or 10 whatever slides. To okay. Yeah, no problem. By the point. Sure. And I'm assuming that uh, Dave has your email address and that sort of thing. Yes, I do. He knows how to find me. <laughs> I'll drop a note in the next couple of days or so. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you guys, yes. this has been really fun. It's been really great to hear all the Chicago accents, I gotta say, oh man, I'm really <laughs> Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Nice presentation. Have a great night. Stay good. safe. Have a great Bye.